All right, I guess we can start. Uh, okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, and welcome to another episode of Lambda Test Webinar. Always a pleasure to host a great audience. And today we're going to sneak peek at how Dunnell underwent through its digital transformation journey to rebuild and redesign their e-commerce platform for faster digital delivery and how it positively impacted their online growth during the pandemic. The new normal that we live in today, right? So before we get started, let's take care of a few housekeeping items. This webinar is going to be an hour and a half long. So in case you need to drop off, you don't have to worry about it. We have the session recorded and it will be shared with you over your registered email address. And you can also find the recording of the entire session of our YouTube, cha YouTube channel, as well as uh, of the previous webinars, right? So with that said, this is going to be an open AMA session. So we would love to hear from you in case you have any questions that you want us to answer, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll be picking these up as and try to answer as many as possible after we have uh, discussed the Dunham's digital transformation journey. So having said that, I will now share my screen. So could you confirm if my screen is visible? It is, yeah. Awesome. So to give an overview, uh, Dunham is a billion dollar British home furnishing retailer with 169 superstores three high street, uh, high street stores, and over 100 in-store coffee shops throughout the United Kingdom. It is an LSE listed, uh, it is listed on the LSE stock exchange. And in 2017, Dunham came up against a challenge which is familiar to many brick and mortar retailers. And that is how to meet the modern tech savvy uh, demands, consumer demands with legacy infrastructure. And the company started its digital transformation journey at around, uh, you know, at the same time, and it took them 18 months and somewhere around October, 2019, the entire platform was rebuilt and redesigned in order to give a faster digital experience to all of its customer in a more optimal manner. And today we are thrilled to have the Dunham panel on board who have been there and done that. And I would like to welcome Stuart, Ali, Adam, Tommy, and myself, like, you can see me there. I'm the host of this webinar, Harshad this side. And uh, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have all of you on board. And with that said, I'll not chat, chat anymore. I'll pass on my bait on to the Dunham team. So feel free to introduce yourself guys to the audience. Okay, hi guys. So yeah, so I'm Stuart Day, uh, head of quality at Dunham. Um, been in this role since beginning of September. Before that, I was one of the principal QAs at Dunelm. Um, a little bit about myself. So 23 years, almost 24 years in software delivery, um, 11 of those years within the agile space itself, um, and big believer in you know, uh, co uh, quality coaching and quality first mindsets. Uh, I'll hand over to Ali. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ali, Ali Warsami. I'm a quality principal at Dunelm, uh, looking after the quality side of the selling domain. I have joined Dunelm uh, at the beginning of December last year, and I'm passionate about uh, quality throughout the software development life cycle. I have also been part of a number of successful agile transformation programs for different uh, corporates, such as uh, Halford, TUI, and Travis Perkins. I will hand it over to Adam. Thanks, Ali. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm also a principal quality engineer at Dunelm. I joined in April last year, uh, actually rejoined. I was with Dunelm for a couple of years as a contractor in the past, and I've rejoined as a permit. Um, on joining, um, I have been looking at trying to improve the quality culture at Dunelm. Uh, Stuart's been heading that up and he asked me to have a look at a particular challenge, which I was looking at previously. Um, and it is actually around our replatforming. So how we've gone from a monolith to a microservice based architecture. And we had we carried over some of our old cultures and ways of working around test and quality from that, which don't really match anymore. So I've had a bit of a focus around how do we improve our ways of working for that new platform? And hopefully I'll get an opportunity to talk to you in a bit more detail about that uh, further on in the session. And I'll pass it over to Tommy. Yep. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Tommy Tihanan. 
Um, um, I've been in this current role, performance uh, principal performance engineer since November, but before that, I was a performance engineer at Dunlop, and I've been at Dunlop about three years overall. I got a similar time with Adam. Um, <clears throat> other, other, other than that, I've been doing performance as my main kind of focus for about 20 years. So started as a performance tester and, and, and I've dwelled in many, many different areas in performance tuning um, and, and the uh, site speed kind of things and APM. So it was something that probably will and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk through in this presentation. And I'm happy to take any any questions in, in area. Thank you. Awesome. So good to have you on board. As I said, like it's been an absolute pleasure to have the entire Dunlop panel over here and to give us a brief walkthrough as to how Dunlop adapted the entire digital transformation initiative. Having said that, I'll now speak, uh, refer to the agenda that we're going to cover in this webinar. So we're, we're going to briefly touch upon, you know, what is digital transformation in general? What are the challenges that Dunlop faced with the conventional approach? What were the cultural and process the uh, you know transformations that were seen by Dunham to overcome these challenges, which tech stack that was uh, they used and utilized in order to you know leverage uh, the digital transformation initiative and what was the impact of that tech stack. And at the end, we'll have a Q and A session. We'll we'll be happy to take as many questions as you can throw our way, and we'll try to be as honest as we can and give it to you know the best of our expertise. So we'll try to answer it with the best of our expertise. So having said that, I'll. Uh, stop sharing my screen so Stuart can take it over from here and we'll see how then step it up again. Yeah. Thanks, Harshit. Okay, so. Can I get a thumbs up that you can see the presentation, guys? Yeah, awesome. Okay, guys, so what, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a little bit of time to just talk through, um, firstly, you know, why we replatformed or why we decided to replatform um, at Dunelm. Um, a little bit about the journey we've been on to, to do that, um, what sort of things have had to change during that time, and also talk a little bit around some of the benefits that we've seen. And this is genuinely, this is a journey that we're still on. So whilst we may have already, you know, we, we put a new platform out there, we're still improving that platform. We're still improving how we do things, you know, innovate, innovating on those things as well, both technically and from a people's behaviors, cultural perspective. So hopefully this will give you some ideas of, of you know, how this can work. Um, we've had challenges along the way. Um, it's not all been plain sailing. It would be lying if we said it was. So. Um, hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll um, take something away from this and uh, when we get into the Q&As you can ask us a lot more questions around what we've done and, and you know, what we are now doing as well. So firstly I just want to talk a little bit around you know, why did we re-platform. So we were um, at the time we back in 2017, 2018 we were on a very old monolithic um, platform and when we were looking at that platform and actually then looking at where we wanted to go as an organization, it was very evident that that platform was not going to be able to provide us, you know, what we needed. Um, so one of, our, one of our biggest goals here is around accelerating our customer first transition. Okay, so as an organization, you know, we want to look at the purpose and proposition, and we've got key focus areas and foundations and shared values that we're trying to go after as an organization. And we need to give ourselves a platform that would really help us drive that forward. So we've always been very much a bricks and mortar company with a website. Now we're actually looking at how we become an, uh, an omni-channel um, retailer that is you know, digitally tech focused. And that was really, really important to us. And as I say, our original platform was not gonna enable us to do that. There's a lot of discussions around how can we do it? Do we go and buy a new off-the-shelf product? Do we engineer internally? And the decision was made to engineer internally, which to this day, we all agree was the right decision, uh, even though it's caused us some challenges and, and but it's brought some great learnings along the way. Um, so the journey to, to the new Dunham.com then. So 
as I mentioned, we were originally on a monolith architecture. So I'm, I'm going to take you over a bit of a three year journey, um, October 2018, October 2019 and October 2020. Um, so in October 2018, we'd already started on the process of, you know, the replatform. So it had already been decided that we were going to go and, and build in-house. Um, and but at the time, we were still on our IBM WebSphere Commerce platform. Now, as I mentioned, it was monolith um, and didn't really provide us technically what we needed to move forward. In terms of how we were structured as teams at that point as well, and this is really important and a big part of the transformation we've been on, um, we were... Yes, some of our teams were focused on um, working in Agile Scrum, but it was a limited amount of them. You know, there was, there was only two or three teams at the time, and you know, the, we weren't able to get change through, those, through the system very easily. We had uh, a real bad code base. We were lucky if we could release once every two to four weeks, you know, test deployments, um, one to two hours, production deployments over two hours, all manually you know, um, driven. In general, the, the, the standard of our quality was, yeah, it was good, all things considered, but we weren't really releasing very often. So it, it's kind of relative in that nature. Um, and also the culture around quality was very much, that's the QA's job, right? That is where those guys need to focus and they can tell us what's wrong. Um, and from a monitoring perspective, again, you know, it was very reactive. Oh, we've got a problem, we need to fix it, rather than us identifying that we had a problem early. It generally would come from you know our customers or you know um, people using the site. So fast forward to um, 2019 and the move towards the new architecture. So we wanted to go microservice. We wanted to use cloud technology. And we would wanted to be API driven. So the decision was also made to go um, with AWS serverless tech. Now for Dunelm, that was a massive decision um, because. Nobody had really, you know, nobody in the organization had done it before. It was a bit of a leap of faith. Um, and, but it was a risk we were determined to make. And one of the big things that has come out of this transformation is we are now the second largest user of uh, AWS serverless tech in the world behind Nike. So that is something that is obviously we're very proud of. Um, and it shows the investment that we've had into our technology platform and our innovation. So in 2019, you know, we went through that process of um, moving, moving across to this new, new, um, new architecture. Um, there was a lot of challenges along the way. We had to re reshape our teams and so on and so on. But in 2019, we actually were able to launch the first version of the new Dunelm.com platform. Um, it wasn't all singing or dancing. Um, we shifted a lot of tech um, or a lot of the platform over to new tech. So as I mentioned, we were using AWS Lambda. Uh, we'd rewritten uh, everything in Node.js, React front end. But we did have still some, even though we were using, everything was in AWS, we, did, we were still using some of the legacy tech. So we still had some of, the, some of our old and most important components like our basket and checkout still in PHP um, using old stack. So that was something that we took a conscious decision to go after um, and release. Um, and for what it gave us, it gave us more value than the risks behind it. So, you know, it enabled us to start releasing more frequently, value to our customers. So on average, we were releasing 20 times a week. Um, the, the teams were very delivery focused at this point because they were trying to deliver the platform. Um, so again, there was challenges around quality. It was a little bit varied. Um, and they kind of got themselves into this mindset of, well, we're not delivering to production, so it's okay if we have issues. And that is always a challenge when you're delivering a new platform, you're releasing into a production environment, but that production environment isn't um, visible to the world. So you kind of get yourselves into a few bad habits. So obviously when we launched, we had to start thinking about how we would change that. In terms of our ways of working, we were utilizing Agile, Scrum and Kanban. We had loads of teams, lots and lots of teams. We adopted the Spotify model at the time. So we, we broke out into tribes and squads um, and you know, we scaled out quite dramatically. The teams are compo component facing teams. Um, so they were very much focused on specific components. Um, and you know, in terms of how often we release, as I mentioned, 20 times a week, 
uh, but our releases were still quite slow. They were still quite cumbersome. They were still quite manual, you know, in, in reflection. Uh, and the quality, as I mentioned, was, was still very varied. Fast forward to 2020 and obviously, you know, continue with the improving on not only the platform, but our ways of working, improving our tech. Um, we started, we, we took out a lot of those still those remaining legacy um, tech. So by 2020, we'd got rid of the PHP stack. Uh, sorry, October 2020, we got rid of the PHP stacks. We started launching new, um, all our AWS um, te uh, serverless tech. Um, we joined forces with Lambda Test. That was actually in April 2020. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that in, in a little bit later. We, we joined forces with Datadog from a monitoring perspective. And we also joined forces with Fastly from a, a CDM perspective. And all these things have helped us continue to build the platform. Our monitoring is better. We've got better CDN provider. We've got better third parties that we're working with that can help support the speed of change that we want to deliver. Um, and you know, that's where the Lambda test has been great for us. Um, and again, you know, from a, a ways of working, it hasn't really changed in terms of the, the frameworks that we're using. We're still using Scrum and Kanban, but our teams have got a different mindset now. They're very much focused on the quality side, but delivering that quality at speed. Yes, there's still some challenges, but the mind, mindset is, is um, aligned. So all our engineers, all our quality engineers, our product owners, VAs, all those guys are very much aligned in terms of we need to deliver a quality product to our customers. In terms of releases, we're releasing 40, up to 40 times a week, around about 200 times a month on some of our, our key um, pipelines. Um, on average, production deployment duration across our pipelines is around 30 minutes. Some of those are doing continuous deployment. Some are still doing continuous delivery. We have different variations of maturity, but this is all stuff that we continue to work on. The quality has been, you know, up to October has been outstanding. We started to notice a few little cracks building in because we're, we're, we're doing so much change and we want to drive at such speed. And again, we're having to reflect back and look at how can we improve those things? So, you know, we're not, we're not sitting on our laurels and going, yeah, we've got the best thing in the world and we're not going to keep improving it. We know if we drop our guard, we're going to, we're going to have some problems. So, yeah, that's a very kind of whirlwind tour of, of what we've done over the last few years. And we'll talk a bit more about that in the Q and A's a bit later. Um, so other than the underlying tech, what, what else had to change? So I mentioned that obviously, you know, ways of working was a, was a key thing, but also, you know, ways of working had to change our tooling had to change. And the biggest thing was our culture and mindset that had to change. So from a ways of working perspective, we had to get better at Scrum and Kanban, for example. And, you know, again, it's it, these relatively, these things are generally thought as easy, the easy part. They're not, it involves people and people, you know, can be challenging and people have different mindsets, which is great. But obviously just trying to get people working collaboratively, um, looking at how we focus on process and you know, highlighting change and you know, to enable and accelerate our delivery is really, really important when we've got a new, new platform that technically can handle change quickly. Um, tooling, again, um, is, is something that we've, we've invested a lot of time and effort into. Um, and that isn't just technical tools such as, you know, as, um, you know, as I mentioned, Fastly, but in terms of tools that we use to, to collaborate. And, you know, so we use BDD, for example, as a means to collaborate within our teams and, and look at the behavior at which we want to drive through our development and to our customer. So it's not just all about the technical side of tooling, it's also about the human element of tooling as well, which can help drive those collaborations. Um, we're looking at things like PACT in terms of contract consumer testing, um, and Adam will no doubt share a bit more around that later. Um, and, you know, again, you know, um, things like Gatlin, GitLab, all these different things that have helped us. But, you know, it's, technology is great, but you still need the people and the mindsets to go with that. And that's where the cultural side and the mindset side of things comes in. So, yes, we're, we're more DevOps culture now. So, you know, we build it, we own it, we fix it. Um, and that's a great place to be. That's been challenging in, in getting people on board with that type of mindset and coaching them and you know, building them up to be that way. Um, but we encourage and support you know, innovation, you know, 
we've got a great, diverse, inclusive culture and team base um, at Dunnell now. And it's just great to see the different ideas that come out. Um, we are actively celebrating a failure within, you know, so we know that failure is not a bad thing. It's a means to learn. And, and we don't have blame cultures or anything like that, which is amazing. Um, but again, you know, it's people need to feel safe to be able to fail. So building that psychological safety is really, really important. And also I've mentioned a number of times around continuous improvement. And that's something that we, we, we need to have else, you know, we'll, we'll fall behind again. And, you know, if you haven't got a fun place to work, you don't want to come to work. Right. So that's, again, a massive, massively important thing that we've been focusing on. Um, also, from a quality perspective, we've had to really focus on how shifting that mindset around quality. So looking at how quality is owned by the entire team. Yeah. Not just the, 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 the quality advocate within the team. Yes, they're, they're the champions of quality, but the whole team is, takes the ownership and the whole team should be representing you know, a, a quality product to the customer and, and, and you know, own that. So what we've, what we've done around this is we, we've spent a lot of time as a chapter really trying to look at different, you know, firstly identifying a quality narrative. So how do we talk about quality at Dunnell and what does it mean to Dunnell? Um, and then you know, also looking at underlying quality engineering principles, behavioral values, and, uh, and the, the foundational side of things to enable, um, you know, enable things to, 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 to happen. So for example, looking at our quality engineering practices, bringing quality and engineering together, right? So how do we engineer with quality in mind? Um, and you know, with our quality engineers on our estates working collaboratively with our engineers, you know, pairing a lot and you know, um, just, just working together on the end solution. You know, so looking at all those different factors there around you know, performance, testability, automation, all these things that we talk about when we're trying to engineer a new solution. Um, the behavioral side of things as well. So that's, that's as if not more important than the actual engineering principles themselves. So if we don't have the right behaviors in our teams and the right mindsets, it's really difficult to, to make these things work. And, you know, um, if, you, if you think over the last year with COVID, you know, we've been onboarding a lot of new people, which is amazing, but it's also been very difficult for people to collaborate and get to know each other and build those relationships, which are really important. Um, and if you look at the, the foundational pieces around team structures, ways of working, how we coach and mentor, you know, tooling, you know, looking at our test architect, there's a whole host of things that we've had to think about, you know, because yeah, the, the tech side of things is one thing, the people side, the mindset side is, is another. And from a quality perspective, it's really, really important that those things uh, are dealt with. Um, so we've spent a lot of time and investment in that. And, you know, we're still building that. We're still um maturing it um but the guys here on the call with me have played a massive part in this and i can't thank them enough to be honest um so once we bring the tech together we look at the, the culture of quality we're really then really focusing on how we shift left and right okay so a lot of people talk about shifting left and you know all the tools and the automation within ci that can come with that and that's great but that's not everything that we can do. So really, when we talk about shift left and shift right at Dunelm, where the, the pipeline side tools, the automation is kind of the middle stage. When we talk about going left, we're going left of the pipeline. So what can we do earlier to collaborate? What can we do earlier to identify what it is we need to build and start building quality in at that point? Um, using tools and automation to help us do that through our pipelines. But then once we get into production, actually, how do we monitor? How do we observe? How do we use, get that feedback from our customers and use that and feed that back in? So we do a lot of experimentation in production. You know, we're, we're looking at, we do a lot of feature flag releases, you know, um, to enable us to test stuff in production, which might sound scary, but also it's sometimes it's the best place to, to test, right? So you know, Tommy will be able to talk a bit more about this later when we, we you know, um, but from a performance perspective for our peak within, you know, when we launched the new platform and, you know, last year, all the performance testing we were doing, all the load testing we were doing was in our production environment. Now, that gives us confidence that we're doing it and we're able to do it in a way that, you know, we're not going to take the customer down. 
Um, but also it, it's a true reflection of what we're going what the customer is going to see if it does go down. And it's a great way of determining how we recover as well. So yes, there's challenges there. Yes, there's you know um, risk, but the benefits as well that you get are, 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 are really great. And that is a mixture of you know tools, automation, culture, mindset, whole pieces that goes into that. So um, it's really really important to to remember that, you know, all these things come together to to make these things work. Um, and it's not easy. It, it definitely isn't easy. Um, so what benefits have we seen? So from a uh, from a platform perspective, so um, we hear, we mentioned here we we're, we're deploying over two hundred times a month. Um, we're able to automatically scale and 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 in, increase our, our availability quite easily. As I mentioned, from a DevOps perspective, we build it, we run it, we own it. Um, our culture is very much you know, find failure and recover quickly. So from a monitoring perspective, uh, feature flag perspective, you know. Um, minimizing the impact, i.e. rolling out to percentage of customers at a time, that enables us to re recover quickly and, and you know, fix forward. Um, we've had significant improvements around web website page load, uh, just on the nature of the tech we're using, but also we've continued to tune that, right? So we've in introduced Fastly, which has helped. There's been a lot of work gone into actually tune, you know, um, our, our AWS instances, what we're doing on the web app, and so on and so on. Um, we can serve over 150% more traffic. So we've built our architecture around APIs and obviously really we're focusing on how, you know, how many calls can those APIs you know, handle and you know, the volume of traffic that they can cope with. Um, from a speed improvements perspective, you know, we've seen about 400, I mean, it's very precise, right? 472% across the entire platform, um, which is amazing. And homepage speeds of over 900%. Again, the, the, these were these are the figures that we had, you know, um, like I think it was late last year, and you know some of these are improving, some of them are, are static, some of them are diminished slightly because we, you know, we we put changes out that haven't quite performed how we expected, and that's fine. That's not a problem because we keep learning from that, and we just need to make sure that we're not, you know, we're not um, allowing those things to be a, of a detriment or keep keep getting worse, for example. But we've also got a much better security. Right. So that is really, really important with a, a digital platform that is now our only shop throughout COVID. And that that is massively important to us. From a partnering with Lambda Test perspective, with the new platform, we really needed uh, a, a, a partner in this space that would able, enable us to, you know, support the speed at which we, were, we, we want to deliver. Right. And that was really important. Um, and with Lambda Test, you know, they, they, they provide us with a much more robust solution than we've had before. Um, and it enables us obviously to test a wider range of browsers and devices. And it's a, a, a speed that, is, that fits within our, our delivery timeframes. Um, it integrated really well uh, with, and easily with the tools that we were using around Test Cafe, Jenkins, and there are others that you've seen. Um, but the, on the ongoing support that we've received since joining Lambda Test has been exceptional. So, and this was one of the biggest things that we were always looking for in a partner is that you, know, you can respond quickly to these issues and 90% of any issues or questions that we have are resolved within a couple of hours, which is amazing, right? Um, and the other great thing is, you know, we are, we've got a good relationship with, with the guys at Lambda Test and they, they listen to what we're, what we're interested in, things that are areas that we, we might be going after and actually Know, thinking about how they can build some of this stuff into their new features so they're actually it does feel like there's a partnership there and we're running hundreds of tests a week through um through lambda test now that might not sound like a lot in terms of some other organizations but we're very precise in terms of the types of tests that we run and obviously we're going for speed so there's that balance between speed and quality that we're trying to hit uh, and that's massively important and then finally culture Right. So culturally, we've seen some massive changes, massive improvements, massive benefits. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, our culture is, is you know, inclusive and diverse. You know, that drives innovation. It, it, the collaboration has been brilliant. Yes, it's been challenging. Yes, you, know, you don't always agree. Right. It's, I'd be lying if we were saying everybody is is always happy and, and always agreeing. But that's that's the idea of of different minds, different ideas. You know, you want to have those conversations. Um, 
we what we're driving a culture of empowerment so again we want people to feel as though they're empowered to you know come up with new ideas and to be honest if we weren't if we weren't in that way the the, the re-platform wouldn't have been as successful as it was right because we had to rely on people and their ideas to help drive those changes and, and, and drive that forward. Um, I mentioned fun earlier. I think, you know, that, that is really important as a, as a, as a, as a cultural benefit. Um, as I say, you, you don't want to come to work and not have fun, even regardless of how, how pressurized it is. And also Dunelm as an organization is very, very friendly, right? You know, it, it does feel like a family orientated company um and that has massively helped us as well and we continue to to drive that through so that is a bit of a whirlwind tour of what we've done over the last few years um and what i'm going to do now is i'm going to hand it back um to harshit and um for questions to the panel so thank you guys for listening thank you so much Stuart, for the walkthrough it was amazing and we seem to have face uh you know, we seem to have received a lot of questions already. So let's start off with the first one. It says, uh, what are the adjustments that you made in your company when the pandemic started? I'll, I'll take that. Awesome, Mali. Hi, everyone. Um, although I wasn't uh, working for Dunelm at the time, but uh, what I have seen uh, within Dunelm that just the main, the, the, the main adjustment that they have made was the cultural change. And, you know, they had a lot of a good culture at the beginning, but they add more where they gave uh, more uh, team autonomy and each, you know, team, they have got their own ways of working. They have, uh, you know, uh, they make their own decisions and they kind of like, you know, uh, create a fun environment you know, amongst them. The collaboration is really, you know, uh, one of those things that you can say that, you know, uh, I'm very proud to be part of this, you know, company. And Dunelm is a place where, you know, uh, uh, you get the support from day one. I joined Dunelm last uh, December and, um, you know, I haven't met um, any of the team members, you know, face to face. But again, I feel home, you know, uh, within the first week or so, because if there was a, you know, the right, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, uh, meetings that I was having, you know, very short to half an hour, very kind of a precise, and uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, hit the target, and it was kind of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you need help from uh, Team X, you can approach it easily, and you know, you can get it, uh, the the type of support that you need. You could, you know sure ideas and when you bring your idea into the table everyone kind of uh, takes on board so you're kind of like you know uh, get the bonding of the you know the, the, the teams that you're working with i'm not sure whether uh Stuart or adam or tom would like to add i was just add a couple of more things maybe about practicalities i think prior to um the pandemic starting a lot of us were able to work from home anyways so there wasn't like a huge technical challenge for the workforce to be able to work from home um, i think maybe i don't know if Stuart, there's something else you can add around just kind of on our warehouses how uh, the distancing uh, social distancing and obviously we had to shop we had to close all the stores so all the emphasis one on, was on the website so there was a i think we were in quite a good spot with the technology for the website i think there were some other things that we were like social distancing on the shipping and things like that 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 maybe had some challenges in the beginning yeah i think uh, i mean on for the first lockdown for example we we were all from, from a website perspective we were all smiling thinking yeah this is fine our website can can deal with this it's not a problem bring it on in actual fact when our stores shut we shut the website down as well and the reason being was from a warehouse perspective, we weren't set up. So we weren't set up for social distancing. Um, so we had to take our website offline. We had to then bring it back up in browse only mode just to keep interest coming in. We had to work really hard to get our warehousing and our, our supply chain back up and running. Um, and, you know, within two weeks, we were back up and running fully, you know, and that, that was a massive achievement in itself. But what it, what it enabled us to do is really able to um, 
see the power of the platform that we built to enable us to adjust so quickly to those that demand and that that change so that was really really key as well so within you know uh, a few hours we had it back up browse only then we had it back up just to support a specific supplier um, or um, one of our supply chains so and then so on and so on and so on yeah if we'd been on our old platform we wouldn't have been able to do that so it, it, it did highlight you know what we built was very flexible which is what we wanted um so that's good awesome so we've had another question which says from a quality and testing perspective what should be the key pointer to note while breaking down a monolithic system into a, more of a microservices based one does service does serverless add more complexity to it so i can take this one um oh shit. so yeah one of the challenges that i was tasked with looking at when rejoining was um how do we check how do we speak to some of the challenges from replatforming from a monolith um to microservices because we carried over a lot of the same testing styles and techniques that we had there and while going to microservices architecture actually alleviates some of the problems around testing for example you can develop and test your indiv your individual change relatively independently um which is much more flexible you can do that quicker you've got more control over it it creates an explosion of integration points um and obviously that makes it much harder you, you, can't, you can't test every integration point locally when you're developing so you rely on pushing things to the pipeline running all of those tests you find out later in the pipeline if something has broken it's also a lot more challenging to manage the data needed for those integration tests across your environments um and so that's that style of testing is is causing us some problems it still works to catch issues you know we've got those those areas covered but it's maybe not as efficient as it could be so we want to look to a way of working that speaks to the way the developers work how they develop independently how they run their unit tests independently we also want integration tests that give us that same ability and there is a way of doing that so we're we've been using and have been exploring uh, consumer-based contract testing and we're specifically using pact for that and the way that that works is that it allows you to essentially run integration tests against the contracts between applications, but to run them independently. They have this concept of a consumer and a provider. And the consumer is the app that's making a request. The provider is the app that's responding to it. Uh, so you start with the consumer. The consumer says, right, we've got a requirement. We need to ask you for something. You're going to return it. So we'll start a contract. And they do that by writing a test, a unit test against their client code. Um, the result of that test is a file, a packed file that details everything they expect to send and receive. We can then share that with the application that's going to respond to it, and it can run that. It can use that test asset to run its own test and check that it's verifying properly, that it's actually responding the way it should do. So we're doing an integration test against the contract, but we're doing it independently. So we don't have to push to an integrated environment where everything's running and wait late in the day to find out whether something's broken or not. We could do it as early as possible in the dev cycle. So that, that works in much more in line in the way you want to work with microservices anyway. So this is something that we've been exploring more and our coverage is, is growing. I think now wherever we're starting new APIs or we're starting to build new stories on existing APIs, we're including Pact as part of that and we're exploring how that works, both from the technical perspective, but also the workflow how do we make sure we communicate properly about these changes we don't want to just push it across technically we want to talk about these changes to one another as well um one area that's more difficult to to kind of bridge the gap is where we've got existing apis where they don't currently have packs so that's kind of a something we need to retrospectively try to add in and that's more difficult so we're looking at a challenge in how we can add to it but so far, we've already seen that the packs that we've added have added value to us. They have found issues earlier on in the, in the development cycle than our integration tests. And um, while that's brilliant, the, the end goal is also that we can start to alleviate some of the pain that we see with our integration tests, the current legacy integration tests, uh, and have a more sensible approach to how many of those we need, how many we need to maintain once we've got our coverage up. Um, in terms of AWS Lambda, I'm not sure it's more complicated. There's a, it's a different complexity over running a monolith. There are different complexities. And once you've understood what that complexity is, 
and you know how to manage it and how to work with it locally, it's not really a problem. So we understand the CLI, CLI tools that we need to use. Um, we've got AWS SAM, we've got um, our Docker set up locally so that we can run those tests in a local uh, Docker, simulating how it would normally run in an environment. Um, so as long as you've got your, your mocks in place, and if you're using solutions like Pact uh, for consumer contract tests, then you can do that in isolation pretty well. Great. So here comes the next one. What impact did the front end redesign have on the performance of your site? Yep, I can, I can make that one. Um, so, so obviously, there, when we started the, the re-platforming, uh, we wanted to create a new front front end to our, our site. And I guess there was a benefit of knowing all the things you don't want to do when designing this. So we designed it, um, we, we designed it from the ground up, not using a framework, uh, like an uh, existing framework as such, but it's a React SVA, single page application that we decided to build. And so we ran the current side parallel with the new side as we were building. So we were able to monitor the difference as we were building. and and. The site performance was one of the most important things to ensure that the, 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 the site performs better than what we have now. So that was clearly all the time on our, on our view, and we had good statistics on that. And it was pretty obvious when we then switched over that it just felt like you're in a different decade. So that um, not many people maybe in this uh, in this uh, audience have used Tunnel in the previous life, but but uh, it's it's a completely different shift when when we um, released the new app. There was also perhaps an element that we wanted to obviously get across the line quickly. So there are perhaps some of the functionality we decided not to take over straight away. Uh, so the, the site was also more bare maybe. So there was an element of using new technology and maybe some reduced functionality and that, that resulted in a very fast experience. Now, since then we've added more functionality and this kind of uh, battle around the site performance is, is ongoing. As we add more things, there's a constant battle of what we should be doing correctly. And there are, there are for example, we have a, a, like a task force in place right now um, that is looking at some some improvements for the site because there's a new um, a Google search engine update coming in May that has a special focus on user experience. So in anticipation for that. So we're not quite where we want to be. I think in overall for the most users, I think we're performing quite well, but there is a kind of a long tail of users on certain devices that don't have as good experience as we want them to have. So it is an ongoing effort, but it's clearly in a, in a completely different category where we are now than where we were before the transformation. Great. So uh, although a little bit of this question has already been answered, but uh, it comes in as how has team collaboration and productivity been impacted by remote working? And how have you ensured this hasn't impact any quality aspect? Oh, cool. I'll take that. Uh, in, in Donelm, we have got um, uh, different service, pro you know, many different service providers. So uh, we already get used to kind of like a, a remote collaboration where we kind of like uh, know what tools to use and how we kind of like overcome that. And when the pandemic came, uh, it kind of became, you know, a business as usual, where a lot of people used to work from home in a way in the first place. And, uh, you know, kind of like taking a bit more and uh, in terms of the productivity, I believe that the productivity has gone up a bit more due to the people being locked down and having a more time to work. Uh, although culturally, we make sure that we also, uh, you know, look into the human side of the employees and have a, you know, a, a kind of like a, 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 you know, personal kind of a chat to understand, you know, the well-being of everyone and so on and so on. And uh, when it comes to the quality, we kind of like don't, you know, we don't compromise uh, the quality. The quality stays in put. So um, every release that we are going to, you know, conduct, we have to, you know, it has to go through uh, all the gates that it uh, should go. So that, you know, in terms of the different layers of the testing uh, and also the involvement for our, you know, quality engineers uh, who are embedded to each and every team 
they kind of like, you know, do shift to the left and they make sure that, you know, they kind of like uh, involved in early stage. So we don't compromise their quality and quality never, you know, kind of dropped um, from where, where it was. I, I just want to add something to that. I think it's, we've, we've done really well to reduce the impact. There's, there's always going to be an impact because of the scale at which we were, the changes that were coming, you know, the, the, the speed at which everything was changing from a pandemic perspective, what is next, what is next. Um, I think we'd set ourselves up to, to, to ride that out and be successful. I think I mentioned in the presentation, we're just starting to see a few little cracks here and there. Um, and you know, that's, that's really important that we're able to identify those things and be open and honest about that to ourselves and say, yes, we aren't as good as potentially we thought we might be. And we need to address these these issues, um, and that's what we're doing. You know, we, we've got roadmaps of improvements we want to continue working on, um, and you know, obviously, when we are, when we're doing stuff at speed, there's always going to be risk to quality, and it's getting that balance right, which is always very difficult. And we have to. That's where the agreements need to come in across our engineering, quality, product communities that everybody is on that same page that, yeah, there might be issues, but can we fix them quick and, you know, resolve them? That's, that's kind of where, where we are with that. Got it. That, that's, that covers it up. So Stuart, there is one question I wanted you to take up. So it was asked while you were presenting, uh, how have you enabled a culture of quality through your engineering delivery and product teams? Uh, so I, I, I touched on this on in the presentation, but I think in, there's there's a lot to it. There's there is a lot to it, and I think the, the the biggest thing that we've tried to do is firstly we needed to so at Dunelm we've we've got a chapter model, so we've got an engineering, quality delivery, um, product chapters, which are great because it really helps you focus in those verticals, but then you've got those verticals that need to come across horizontally and everything you're doing. So if we've got, you know, X amount of crews now, and I think we've got like 12, 13, 14 crews, each made up of two squads, you know, trying to get that horizontal effect is, is quite challenging. So the, 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 the real focus has been trying to bring alignment to our chapters and ensuring that our engineering chapters, our delivery chapters are all on the same page when it comes to quality. So that's why we, we talked about that quality narrative. Um, and that is very much around delivering the right thing in the right way. So we're not just talking about how we test something and, you know, and, oh, we've tested something and it matches the requirements because the requirements might be wrong in the first place, right? So it's really ensuring that what we're looking to develop is the right thing. And then that flows all the way through that, that, whole, um, that whole piece. And it's just trying to shift people's mindsets around that. Um, and I think the, the engineering community is sometimes the harder community to try and shift in terms of, you know, they're willing to do testing, but it's always a question around, they want to go quick. They want to do stuff really, really quickly. And the quality side of things is a difficult conversation to have. So the earlier you can start building quality in, so it helps with that, the, the next levels of, of engineering and testing and so on and so on. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I mean, I could talk all night about this one in particular because it's, it's something that we're doing and we, we, I feel as though we're doing it well, but there's still a long way for us to go as well. Um, so I don't know whether any of the other guys want to jump in and, and add anything or not. I think all we right. did cover it. <laughs> yeah, did, you did cover it a lot of itself, including the presentation. So yeah, so we have next question in which says, uh, you know, QA ops, is that something that one believes in? Yeah, I could take this. Um, right. Yes, it is. Uh, it's something that, you know, Daniel do it in life. And um, every team uh, in Daniel, they do have uh, a dedicated uh, quality engineers who looks after um, the, the quality aspects as well as uh, it is operations. So, uh, you know, uh, we make sure that as a quality uh, advocates that we, you know, uh, uh, go with the flow from idea to life and uh, every team is responsible for the development, the testing and delivery 
or you know, release into the production. So uh, our quality engineers are all go through the, the pipeline and they kind of like, you know, uh, um, make sure that we uh, you know, do all the kind of uh, uh, quality assurance you know, operations uh, throughout the releases. So where we kind of uh, own also, you know, uh, have a lot to say in terms of the pipeline. You know, uh, we look after the, you know, the, the, the release, uh, you know, testing, so on and so on for all the different stages. So uh, yes, that's something that we do believe in. Great. So Jillian has asked, are your dev and product teams all ambassed? Uh, we have challenges due to the teams being based in different countries, so the time zone affects us. Is that something? Yes. So I think. What you'd like to take? Yeah, I, I think it's. Um, we don't have any team. So we do have remote teams. We've got team um, engineering teams, and some of our um, quality engineers are based out in Portugal and um, with a with an organisation called Mindera. So we don't have the same so sort of time difference challenges as say out in India or or that kind of thing. Um, and I think. You know, that is always that is that is a different challenge in the sense of ensuring that you know your it can be an advantage but it also can be a disadvantage so it can be an advantage in the sense of your engineers are still working whilst other people are at home and you know so on and so on but you lose the time frames around collaboration um and that's why we consciously was more keen to have a near shore presence in that sense um with an engineering perspective so that we were able to collaborate and essentially just have an extension of the team that we have in house um, uh, during the same time frames and the same time zones. Um, so yeah, so whilst we do have remote teams, we don't have the, the time difference challenges necessarily. All right, so Gillian has also asked, do you have any advice to get product on board with shift lift? Early walkthrough about the features I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Adam to answer that because he's been doing a lot of this. <laughs> Sorry, Adam or Ali, I guess both of us. <laughs> yeah, is that, yeah, yeah. Either of you. Uh, yes, that's a good, very good question. It's a very good question um, because yeah, it's really important. It is really important. Anything that you want to try and do that's going to eat into time, right? You've always got to balance off improvements against products. You know, trying to trying to get changes in that the business one and sometimes those don't always seem to marry up from products perspective so it's, it's about having the conversations and it's about creating opportunities where um where we can find a, a level playing ground and, and understand that actually a lot of the changes we want to do in terms of quality are really going to help impact how how we deliver product at quality right it's not just about getting the product that we want but or you know make sure the right tests are there but ensuring that the team's fully on board with quality all the way through and that's going to have an, a, a massive impact in the end even if it means that we have to spend a bit of time changing the way we've done something in the past that doesn't seem to give immediate value to the product that we're trying to deliver right now it's super important um, and we have got really good product teams they do understand quality really well um, but again sometimes we don't always create opportunities to talk about our separate needs and requirements so it's about setting up those conversations and having them you know, and the good thing with Dunham is we can have really frank conversations. Um, it doesn't feel like you have to be careful what you say to people or, you know, something might not be very popular. Even if it's unpopular, you can say and have an open, honest conversation about it. So I have a lot of faith that that's something that we can continue to improve on. Great. So we have a question. Uh, has Dunham seen a noticeable change in demand through your mobile site? Yeah, I think over 50% of our usage and revenue comes from mobile now. Um, so it's yeah, mobile is by far the most important uh, uh, interface into the download.com. There is a slight difference in conversion. So I think the, I think the desktop converts con, uh, converts better. So maybe people might, might typically browse more on a mobile still and then prefer to buy on a desktop. <clears throat> the conversion on the mobile is quite stable. Um, tablet is less of a uh, importance nowadays, but um, yeah, mobile is is by far the most important thing. And, and all the 
monitoring that we do really for the site speed is mobile centric. We, we don't really see an issue with the desktop for the, the speed. I think our site is fast enough on a desktop. It's the issues that we have are around mobile. Thanks, that, that helps. So we have a question coming in regarding the presentation that you uh, went through, Stuart. So it says, uh, it's from Angelica and it says, you said you had to get better at Scrum and Kanban. Are you happy with the way you're using Scrum and Kanban now? What were your key learning points and what was the most important improvement there? I think by the, by the nature of them, we're never happy because there's always room for improvement. Um, I think that the, the, I think the challenge that we have is, and I can't remember who it was, I think Ali may have mentioned it in terms of the autonomy, you know, and you know, the teams have, we've kind of, the, the teams have kind of adopted a way of working, either the it be Scrum, Kanban, Scrum Ban, that is, is kind of suiting them. Um, and that has, that has created some challenges when we've tried to get teams working more collaboratively together, you know, in terms of some of the um, behaviours and values and, and such like. Um, and also, I think we've, we've looked at um, probably more so over the last 12 months because of the pandemic, we've kind of moved more probably into a delivery focus. And Kanban has kind of worked well for us for that perspective because we've, we've needed to change quickly. We've wanted to try and do things, you know, a bit more, uh, I'm not going to say freely because there's still structure around it, but in terms of, you know, more of a, an operational perspective, we need to do this now, guys. Can, you know, let's get this through. Let's get it done. Let's get it out. Um, and we're still, we're still trying to work out what, what works best. And this, the last year has opened our eyes to a few things. Um, some of our teams are just using a, a, a framework and not really understanding why they're using it, for example, um, which you know isn't a great place to be, even though it may be working for them. So one of the things that we, we're trying to get better at is really building foundational knowledge around what is Scrum, what is Kanban, how can it benefit you to use this over this? Um, but also more importantly, from a, a quality and testing perspective, how do they differ? How can they impact the quality of what you're delivering um, and you know, how do you test differently maybe in Scrum to what you do in Kanban or just so that everybody is thinking more holistically around the, those frameworks and, and how they impact different roles, different people and how we deliver. So I think, yes, we can absolutely get, we, we're better than we were on day one, but we can need to continue to get better. Um, and I think, you know, we are still learning. Um, and the more teams we have, the more challenging it becomes as well. So we need to try and think about, do we build more alignment, common practices, or do we keep going with or empowerment and autonomy and maybe driving some teams one way or themselves driving them one way and, and creating gaps, which is not really what we want. So there's different challenges we need to face into with some of this, but it's, it, we're better than we were. We still need to get better. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, I guess that must have answered. In case you have any follow-up questions, feel free to drop them again, and we'll be happy to take that up on this one. So having said that, uh, we have the next one in line. And this is more about by what metric are you, this is from Bilal, by what metric are you evaluating the use of uh, Lambda test? Uh, is there any particular metric in place on which the product is being evaluated on? So from a from when we did the the the, the POC with, with Lambda test, the, the one of the big things that we were there was there was two big factors. One was um, in terms of you know spin up times and how how things would spin up in, in terms of you know, speed to um, enable our test to run. And the other one was very much around the support we would get you know if we had an issue. Um, and previous uh, providers, you know, they, they were challenges for us. And that for us, it wasn't about, you know, um, can we run the test in these different browsers or anything like, like that? Because a whole host of, there's a whole host of people out there that offer the same type of service that can do the same thing in terms of that coverage and maybe more. But it was very much about having somebody to partner with that understood our values, understood our ways of working 
and would be supportive of that. And we talked a lot about that when we were speaking with Lambda Test originally. And I, I'm happy to say that since you know signing up and, and working with the guys, it has come across that you know they are able to support us very very quickly if we have an issue. You know we've not had any issues in our pipelines from a you know a speed to test perspective. Um, and and that, that those were the key measures for us. As I say, we don't we don't run thousands of tests a day, right? We don't need to run thousands of tests a day, but the tests we do run are very valuable, and we need them to run quickly. Um, and if we do have an issue, we need that issue resolved quickly. And they were the metrics that we were really working towards. Thanks. If, I, that. if I can just follow on with that one, yeah, go for just, it. Please, please I guess I would. On. I guess I would just say that. Um, with with this and with everything else that we do, we do still try to evaluate everything that we're doing continuously as part of our continuous improvement, right? To just to double check, are we using this to its full capacity? Is there still value in the way that we use this? Um, because quite often, we, especially larger companies, can fall into the trap of this is the standard, this is the way we're working, we keep using it, and we only find out later, actually, you know what, we've caused ourselves some pain by not doing this the right way or not using it to its full capabilities. So it's something that we we're trying to continue to evaluate um, our use of, you know, Lambda test or our, our use of, of, of this tool or that tool or service provider and just verify, you know, are we, are we, have we got the best out of this partnership? Can we get more from it? Um, do we need to involve anything else? Is there something else we do? And, and this, this ties into our UI automation and testing uh, strategy overall. So there's a lot of questions that we have still about how do we approach our tests? With this we like the setup we've got but we know we've got some challenges there are certain tests that are there that perhaps don't give value that they should and there are maybe other ways that we can test those those things so part of our continuous improvement is always to continue to evaluate based on how we're currently working and seeing if there's any cracks or anything that we need to have a further conversation with and as as stuart said we found that lambda tests have been a really good partner whenever we have evaluated and thought you know what we need more or we need to sort them about we know we've got some more performance testing we'd like to do through through the front end. Is that something they're thinking about for their for their backlog? Can we join that conversation? That's always something they've been open to and had a, that continued dialogue with us. Thanks a lot, Adam. It it really means a lot, you know, hearing it from Adam Stewart and the rest of the uh, Dunham panel. Uh, we always focus a lot on you know how we can be more responsive because we we believe in you know, uh, deploying fast things faster. We, we are a product first company. We want to ship faster. And that that's the kind of goal we have. And that's the kind of, you know, platform we are trying to deliver so that, you know, every customer that we have on board is able to be more productive and leverage the best out of, uh, you know, their testing cycles by using our execution platform. So your words, they, they really mean a lot. Thank you so much. And having said that, so we have this question, being a big e-commerce moving from one platform to ad hoc, it comes with a big challenges, big set of challenges from a tech point of view. This will ine inevitably impact SEO from at least two points, page speed and the number of pages duplications, hence their organic traffic. How is that managed? Yeah, I, I can try. I think in all fairness, we probably don't have the right person on this panel, but I'll, I'll try. I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's a massive challenge. Uh, I, I have a feeling we did work with some agencies to help us. I think one of the, one of the things we did do is that we, we, we carried over the, uh, the, the taxonomy or the, 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 the URLs themselves. I don't, I can't really answer how much of benefit that was in the end. Uh, but also a lot of our traffic comes from paid. So um, that will probably have a factor in as well. Yeah, I think that's probably the best I can do at this moment. So hopefully um, that's okay for now. So probably we uh, maybe later down the road, make, maybe conduct an, another webinar with the Dunham team and get SE experts on board in the marketing side as well. So have a one-to-one -one on that side as well. So we'll, we'll take these questions up over that time. So. Uh, these are definitely good questions, but uh, we, we can queue this up. And definitely, as I said, like we've noted all of these questions down and we'll try to get back to you uh, as if you can just reach out to, you know, our chat support and just pinpoint that, hey, I, I asked this question there and we'll, we'll be happy to help on that side. So from our, our, perspective, our perspective and if we can get some response from Donald later on. So having said that, uh, so there's this question in terms of shifts and trend around quality and testing, what would you say 
are the key things to focus on and get better at? Is that something you would like to answer? Or maybe I'll repeat the question. Uh, in terms of shifts and trends around quality and testing, what would you say are the key things to focus on and get better at? I'm trying to speak to some of that, I think, I think a little bit. I mean, my, my perspective, when I, I used to work as a contractor for a while and I moved around a lot. And I, I don't know about trends, but I would always say, look at the way that you're, <clears throat> do you want as a culture in the company, what you're trying to achieve as a company, and also look at how you're building your software and your quality culture should follow that right you, you can't you can't try and have a separate initiative around how you do testing and quality that's separate from the way that you develop or your architecture or, or the direction that your business wants to go in so it's more about not worrying too much about the trends in the market unless they specifically align to the way that you're doing things like for example you're going microservices you start looking at trends at how that is a trend in the market people are going that way so you start looking at what are the trends around quality and testing for microservice and we've talked about consumer contract testing as one of the solutions that help work in that the correct way for microservices um, but the most important thing is to to talk to the way that you're working so if you're working with a monolith you know there's no point there's no point trying to implement um, ways of working that don't really work with that style you have to work and test and, and have a quality culture that speaks to the way that you develop your software uh, and the culture that you have in the company. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, from, from my perspective, I think if, if we look at the industry um, now in terms of you can't, well, you scroll through LinkedIn, you, you, you look at uh, job adverts, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is crying out for automation, right? And it's actually quite damaging to, I think, a lot of people in terms of, you know, the, the drive just purely around automation and you know, what, the, what people expect that to give you. Automation is an enabler to, you know, all different things, right? And one of those great things is, you know, enables you to explore your products manually, you know, far, far better because you've got time to do it. Um, you know, for me, I think from a, a, a trends perspective, you know, I would I would encourage people to be looking more around you know their balance and you know not looking for the silver bullet. Um, automation is definitely not a silver bullet. It's a means to check something that you've you know you've asked your automation to check, right? So use all the different types of tools and techniques you have to to build you know the the approach that you you want to take, right? And that way you'll start getting the the best quality out there um it you know it is you know, ensure that you've got a mix of people with different skills uh you know don't be afraid to have people in your teams that are you know what what people were manual testers right i mean i don't agree with that term personally um but you know don't be afraid to have exploratory testers that are you know have expertise in that area that mix well with engineers that are very good at automation and things like that they're all going to help each other um, and that for me is, is the biggest thing and, and I would encourage people to be mindful of whether you're, you know, you, whether you are a QA, whether you are a, a, a leader in, in any organization, don't look for a silver bullet because it's not there. Thanks, Stuart. And we have the next question coming in. Uh, boards are addicted to the numbers. Is there a specific set of metrics you use with them that is not team level metrics? Yeah, so I th I'm happy to take this one. So one of the things that we've worked really hard on actually during, during the replatform and since is how we structure not just our teams, but how we structure our levels of communication. So up, up the leadership stack, if you like. And actually, to be fair, we're quite a flat structure at Dunelm. So it's, you know, it, it's quite easy. We really look at everybody as peers rather than managers. Or, or, and we very much focus on leadership. Um, rather than management um, so just to make that clear to start with but in terms of like if we're reporting to the exec then you know we work very closely with them to determine you know what is it you need what is it you need from a communication perspective right so what the the detail that we get with the teams on the ground that is for those teams right what they capture as part of their their outputs from their their, their iterations 
you know, um, and their, their velocity and stuff like that is for the team. Velocity is for your team. It's not for a reporting metric further up. Um, but what we are, what we have been doing is talking more around, you know, our, every everybody wants to know when something's going to land right because obviously with, with delivering something comes revenue which is really really important um but what we're trying to do more of is provide what we what we class as like landing zones i.e you know this is going to land somewhere during this time and by the nature of agile as we get closer to this time we're going to know more so we're going to get more accurate with what that looks like so we might turn around and go oh, we'll land in the next two months as we get closer through our sprints, we go, actually, do you know what, guys? It's coming in, it's coming in. But it's about keeping that open communication going. And we do that for a few different means. Um, so we have a biweekly, um, uh, like a delivery um, update. There's a tech um, update every month, you know, that goes out. And as, as you kind of go through each of these different communications, you'll see there's a, a level of abstraction that comes. So we're not trying to go with loads of detail, but we did work really hard with our exec and the leadership team to understand exactly what they need rather than just assuming you want all this stuff. And it's very much about what they need rather than what they want in a lot of cases as well. So always have those conversations to determine what, what what's required. So hopefully that answers that question. I believe so. So suddenly, so the next one that comes in is uh, how is Dunham approaching for PWA, Progressive Web Apps? Yeah, I can take that. Yeah, so we we do have PWA. Uh, I think it's probably a bit of a punt at the moment. Uh, we're not really focusing on it. In all fairness, I guess we're a little bit looking at what, what how how the industry is moving around adoption on PWA. We haven't really implemented a lot of the things that you could get from notifications and offline reading and things like that. So I think for at the moment, it is something that we did as a hopeful kind of target to, to improve the page speed overall uh, and just to see what we can do with that at the moment. I don't really know the statistics and I'm not sure how carefully we, we follow them. I don't think that the adoption is very high in all fairness. But it's obviously we're open to it. I think from the technical perspective, we are ready to implement, but we might end up going with the native app or, yeah. So I, it, we, we are we undecided about that at the moment, in all fairness. All right. No worries. So uh, uh, we have this one coming in. Do you believe in the buzzword shift lift testing? Yeah, we touched that earlier, uh, but the question adds up to, would you rather shift right with the feature flags to test in production, or would you prefer with shift left? Yeah, I'm happy to, to talk a bit more about that. I mean, as I, I mentioned it in the, in the presentation that, you know, we, we're trying to, to create that whole culture of how can we learn, feed it back in. Um, so we, we, we do both. I mean, I'm not, I, I, I don't believe in the buzzword shift left testing. I believe in shifting left and shifting right um and using different techniques i mean you know there's different techniques test techniques that you can use um general collaboration techniques you know all these different things um to to shift left and as i mentioned in the presentation for me you know a lot of times when we talk about shift left testing people just talk about the pipelines and automation and tools but actually you can go further left and it's much more important to go further left than that um so i think you know that's why we just focus on the shift left, shift right. And the, as I mentioned as well, that the feature flag side of things is really important to enable us to put stuff out. Um, but again, some of that does come with risk, right? It's the testing production does come with risk. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, Tommy, whether you want to talk a bit more about what we did from a production perspective when we were doing some load testing, but the results we got were, were amazing, but it did come with some risk. So, we're we're a believer in both, um, and but we have had to kind of have a lot of, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for, mitigating conversations to say it's okay for us to do this. Don't be afraid, um, because you know it it will bring value. Um, yeah, yeah. I think the feature flags has it's been quite a powerful tool for us in the past 
maybe nine, ten months. I think we've done a lot, and we we we're using them uh, quite uh, extensively for different tests and and for example, an A and B testing. Uh, so we have like, for example, we have a quite a big UI change coming now. When we're just pushing it with the feature flag and doing some A/B testing to see what to take up ease on that change. So I think that's been a very powerful tool. Yeah, we do that even for the performance testing, like Max just said. So it is definitely something um, I would recommend uh, looking into. Yeah. All right. That's great. Thank you. So. Uh, let me just have a look at this questionnaire. Okay, so it's, this one's for Stuart. My experience is that team culture is generally not where the problem lies. How about we talk leadership? Do you ever have to justify the investment in quality? Do you put a cost in quality issues? Uh, the answer is you, we always have to justify quality. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if we have an issue, it's all about, it's, it's justified in the sense of, you know, why do we have the issue? Um, so I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I think that, the, you know, the, from a leadership perspective, um, what, we've, what we've tried to do is look at how we, how we measure that quality and how we communicate that. So often, you know, we'll, we'll talk a lot about, you know, well, teams will talk about, you know, how many tests they've got, how many automation tests they've got, how many failing how many passing we don't generally we don't do that so we don't really talk about those kind of things those metrics are for the teams in terms of how we measure quality it's very much about you know have we had any issues that have escaped into production that have created uh, that have impacted our customers right now when we talk about issues that doesn't necessarily mean bugs but have we released something that actually you know isn't performing how we want it to perform from a, a customer perspective so have we have we not understood what our customer needed? Um, because again, that means we haven't released a quality product to our customer. So that's where understanding our customer is really important. Um, and you know, we do a lot of experimentation in production. So using tools like Monotate and, and those kind of things, um, just to try and get an idea of what our customers want and what works best. Um, so when, when we do then come to start talking about quality as, uh, you know, as a whole, um, those conversations that are much more customer related and therefore it's easier to put some sort of metric or conversational value around, you know, the, the, the benefits of the quality that we're trying to build in. Um, so I think that from a leadership perspective, you know, that's what, how we're supporting our teams. Um, and, you know, we don't, we don't, I mean, we don't push for anything in terms of reports, you know, um, test failure metrics or anything like that. It's not just something we do because there's no, the only value to that is to the teams. There's no value wider than that, right? So we only focus on what's going out into production and what the what has come back, um, whether it's good, bad, or, or indifferent. All right, so. Do we have any more questions coming in? I uh, we seem to have answered a lot of them. We're still waiting, folks. We still have ten minutes. In case you have any questions that you would like to ask further, please put through. So I just see another one in the chat. Um, AI doing all the automation soon is another nice fantasy that seems to be doing the rounds. Is that a question or is that just a, a statement? I'm not sure. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about the AI thing. I think, um, oh, it's a statement. There you go. I don't need to talk about it. That's great. <laughs> All right, then. I guess we are pretty much covered here with the Q&A round. And in case you still have any questions, we are still live. Please feel free to ask them in the chat and we'll be happy to answer. And with that, I'll just, you know, we'll just wait for a couple of minutes maybe. And meanwhile, I can maybe flaunt Lambda a little bit in the, in the meanwhile, and you can just talk about, uh, so Stuart has definitely pitched how Lambda has helped them uh, 
grow, uh, you know, move, accelerate their delivery process and ship features faster, you know, uh, the response and other aspects that uh, Stuart has picked up so far. But uh, I would just like to quickly, you know, share my screen here a little bit and just give a basic walkthrough. Uh, not exactly walkthrough, like I'll just continue with this uh, slides that we had and earlier, just give me a second. Let that slide open up. So meanwhile, like uh, any other like slides, it's not really important. I'll just quickly brief. So basically, Lambda is more of an execution platform. Uh, we give you more than 2,000 browsers on cloud to come up and, you know, run your website. And what we are trying to, uh, you know, solve the pain point is to deliver a cloud-based infrastructure so you don't get stuck, you know, and you don't delay your deliverables by, you know, working out a machine on your local, you know, it's, configuring your own device lab and doing, you know, uh, a lot of uh, consuming a lot of your DevOps bandwidth and configuring the in-house infrastructure. So what we do is we basically provide a cloud-based infrastructure where you can come up and spin any browser, any operating system that you would want. And I will just quickly share my screen now so we can have a look at the uh, platform real quick. And I'll just give you a brief showcase in case you guys haven't been aware of it. So let me share. Do we have a question? Yeah. Okay. So let me know if you can see my screen and Yeah, we can, yeah. Awesome. So this is what the platform is. And what we basically have here is a large list of browsers. We have around 2000 plus browsers on board. You can come up, type in URL that you want to test. You can select different browsers here and whichever versions you want to test upon. Sometimes it, ha it so often happens. It, it, is, it does happen that, you know, you cannot install uh, an Internet Explorer on Safari. And similarly, you cannot have, you know, uh, an Internet Explorer on Mac OS, I'm sorry. And similarly, you cannot have a Safari browser on your Windows machine. So in case you have that kind of situation, and definitely they are very important from a testing perspective. So you want to make sure that whatever traffic that you're you know, getting over your website, you want to make sure that the experience is seamless. So we make it easy for you to come up and spin any machine that you want from here. So in case like I have a Windows machine here, and if I would want to see Lambda test over the website, I can pretty much go up here, just click the start button, and that will be it. Now this is more of a real-time testing feature. What uh, this is, this will help you interact with the VM live, and you can come up, spin your test, you know, go through different kind of features that we have here. Now this is one of the things that we have. The other one where you know uh, Dunham has been very rigorous about is the automation feature that we have. That what we basically have is a Selenium-based, uh, you know, Selenium grid on our cloud, and that helps you you know, automate your Selenium scripts and run it over the same set of browsers and operating systems that were reflecting in the real time. So you can come up and open any test that you have. And by default, once you execute that test from these, uh, you know, your system, all you need to do is just tweak uh, your username and access key that will be provided once you log into Lambda test. And once you configure that, you can choose the set of desired capabilities that you want. And we have a capability specific generator for that. And then you can run up the test a screen recording will automatically happen in case you don't want that to happen. We have a capability which you can set to false and then you can debug and do all kinds of stuff here. So please feel free to come up and give a spin to the platform and your first 100 automation minutes are absolutely upon us. So you don't have to worry about that. And we have a freemium plan in place which gives you uh, month on month, you know, uh, your minutes gets renewed for manual testing. So feel free, we also have uh, you know, a new proposition here, which is the LT browser, and that helps you actually test your website on different mobile devices in a side-by-side -side view. So you can come up and you know, have a look at the platform and see for yourself if that helps you. And with that said, I will stop my sharing because I don't want to flaunt too much of what we have here. <laughs> I guess I've, I've done a lot of that already. So do we have any more questions here? Anything new that 
came up with. Doesn't look like it, Harsha. Yeah, does not look like that. So I, I no. believe we picked up uh, a lot of questions already. So I, I, I think we've answered a lot of queries to um, you know, our viewers. And in case you have uh, you know, any questions or anything, as I pointed out earlier, we have a 24 seven app in app chat support, and it's also available on our website. You can come up, uh, drop your questions and anything you're concerned related to or around this webinar, you can find this full recording over our YouTube channel. And uh, if you have already registered, you'll get it over your email as well. So having said that, uh, uh, you can let us know in case you have any questions and we'll be happy to help. And with that, I think we can give it a good wrap here. Stuart, would you like to add something over here before we log off? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, thank you very much, uh, Harsha, and to the team at Lambda Test for setting this up. It's been really great. Um, if anybody does have any more questions, then just feel free to reach out to any of us directly. Always happy to help. Um, and yeah, just I hope everybody enjoyed it. I hope we managed to answer everybody's questions okay. And um, we did our best. That's you know as, as best we can do. And I just want to thank these guys as well because they're you know they're they're brilliant, and I'm very lucky to have them on my team. So. I, I too would like to extend our thanks to the entire Dylan panel. I know you guys are bil uh, busy building amazing stuff, especially when Tommy pointed out that Google is coming up with an SEO update. I know you're pretty occupied with that. That's coming up very soon. So yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking you know time out of your busy schedule and you know helping us give a brief idea and you know a good explanation to all of the you know questions that there were around Dunham's digital transformation. It was amazing insight. I'm pretty certain our viewers must be feeling the same way. And we look forward to collaborating further with the Dunham team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Bye guys. Take care. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Thanks.